That was an awesome lecture. We are going to um, move on to a couple different topics, which are the other cool things that you can do um, with belly ultrasound. And that's the appendix and SBO. So I know you guys are thinking that you've actually never seen an appendix or certainly um, couldn't find an appendix. So this is just at least the overviews of what to be looking for um, and a little bit about um, the um, bowel obstruction. So the first thing about appendicitis is which probe to select. So I always start with the linear probe. The reason I start with the linear probe is one, when the appendix is inflamed and giving you that focal peritonitis for the classic right lower quadrant pain, um, the, the, super, the structure is gonna be fairly superficial. It's gonna be up and, and annoying the abdominal wall. The other thing is, um, in theory, you're going to have the best luck in skinny patients, which we all know, which is why it's so appropriate for pediatrics or skinnier um, patients. It's not to say it's impossible, but um, because we're dealing a lot of the times with um, different body habituses, you can actually try the curvilinear probe. You just may not have as high of success rate. That being said, if the appendix is really inflamed and really angry, it might want to be seen, and so it may be worth a shot. So where does the appendix live? So we all know that the appendix is this blind-ended pouch that just sticks off the end of um, the cecum. Um, what its function is, of course, is left to be determined. But um, the appendix, unfortunately, um, has a few different positions. So uh, for most people, it's actually retrocecal, which is that dotted line um, kind of right here. Um, and then it can fly over and move all other places. That being said, like I said, um, clinically, when we suspect, highly suspect appendicitis or people are, are really um, irritated, it's often because the inflammation has pushed the appendix into a more prominent or um, anterior spot. So there's three basic techniques um, that I'm going to start with for talking or finding the appendix. And the first, I think, is just the easiest, which is to start where it hurts. So um, you have the patient literally take their finger and point to the um, the area of maximal tenderness and start there. So I take my linear probe and I start looking right there and see what I see. The second technique, which I think is very helpful, is to identify the external iliac vessels and to look around those. Here it says medial, but you can look around in a variety of places. So right here, this vessel right here, the iliacs, and then this thing overlying it, boop, that's the appendix. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what the appendix has to look like, but essentially, um, this is what bowel looks like. You guys have done some bowel ultrasounds and you know it's kind of this layered structure that's hyperechoic with some hypoechoic inside it. But the key to the appendix is that it's blind-ended. That means that it terminates at some point. So if you do identify this vessel, then you're going to follow it a little bit and make sure it comes to a circle at the end, a blind end at the end. For instance, up here is another loop of bowel, but if you kept going, that thing would just keep going and keep making um, a shape, like a tubular shape, and just never finish with a circle at the end. Finally, there's this technique um, where you use graded compression to follow the cecum down to the end. I think that that's a little bit tricky just since um, it looks to me like a whole bunch of white gas with more white gas, um, and I think that this is probably the most difficult. That being said, for the sonographers who do this every day, this is definitely a technique they use, and they may even start with the curvilinear probe, follow the cecum down until it terminates, and then say, hey, well now I know I'm at least in the right spot, and now I'm gonna switch to my linear probe and start there. So unfortunately, a normal appendix, um, like I said, is not necessarily easy to see. So we all know from working in pediatrics that finding a child with an appendix and saying, hey, the, the appendix is normal happens about a third of the time. The other third of the time, it's actually appendicitis, um, which means a third of the time we just don't find it. So um, even for sonographers who do this for a living, um, we aren't always going to find the appendix. The sensitivity and specificity is going to range, and that mostly depends on um, patient factors and also sonographer factors. So the better you are, the more likely you are to find it. Um, and we see the appendix um, better when people are skinny. Um, 
which used to mean kids, I guess doesn't always mean kids now, but um, younger, um, thin kids, thin adults. So here's some pictures of the appendix. So we talked a little bit, of, these are normal appendix. So we talked a little bit about what we're looking at. So right here, we see this finger-like projection or this tubular projection that has a blind end right here. Overlying is just abdominal muscle. And then here might be a, a vessel. Here's another example in the short axis. So here's the vessel that we saw before. Here's superficial skin, abdominal um, wall muscle. And right here, this circle is the appendix in the short axis. Here again is the appendix in the long axis. Whoop. And it goes out to that finger-like projection. And one more time, this one's a really sneaky one. All the way over here. So here's the iliac vessel right here. Another um, structure that people often use because the appendix often lives right around it is the psoas muscle. So this right here is actually psoas muscle. So sometimes people say look around the psoas muscle, the iliac vessels, and the appendix should be somewhere around there. Here's a live action shot right here. So this finger-like projection is the appendix, here's the vessel, here's the abdominal wall, and you can actually see that the operator is trying to compress the structure as well, which is one of the things that we're going to do once we look at the appendix or find the appendix. So how do we diagnose appendicitis? So really, um, there's the two criteria for appendicitis. The first criteria is just identifying that this is indeed the appendix. So the first thing is it's a tubular structure in the right lower quadrant um, that has a blind end. So that's the appendix. It's greater than six millimeters. So that's where we say, hey, this appendix is a little bit too big. That being said, we all know that there are people who have a uh, bigger than normal appendix for whatever reason. Um, so the other things that we look for is that it's a non-compressible structure. So we try to um, put some pressure, graduated pressure, um, and see if we can compress the thing. There's some secondary signs as well, and those essentially um, include periappendiceal fluid and an appendicolith. So here we have a couple measurements. And um, so here is our appendix. Here's this blind into tubular structure. Here's the vessel actually in long axis. And then here's the measurement. And so you'll notice that the measurement actually includes any sort of periappendiceal um, edema, and I actually, if, if I were going to um, critique this, I would drop this A down to here. So essentially you start up here, the top of where the, the black around the, the finger is, and go down to the black around the finger is. Um, and so if that's greater than six millimeters here, it's nine millimeters, then that's concerning for a big appendix. Here's another example in the short axis. And you can actually watch as the operator is pressing. So in this clip, you can see that the vessel is kind of moving up and down. That's because they're pressing. And if you've ever squished on somebody's bowel, we can do this in the hands-on, the bowel should just squish away. And this isn't squishing away at all. This little target sign, this little circle, is just staying right there. And then when we measure, again, we're measuring from the outside of the black to the outside of the black, and we're getting about 10 millimeters. So that's too big. Another sign is um, hyperemia. So um, sometimes they call it the ring of fire. There's a couple other ultrasound terms that also are the ring of fire. Um, but hyperemia obviously would imply that there's um, some inflammation in the area. So if you try to apply color and you can see it's a little bit dark on the screen, but right here is the actual appendix and then all the vascularity surrounding it here. And then here's an example of an appendicolith. So just like Haney was just talking about gallstones being these hyperechoic structures with the shadowing behind them, that's exactly what a, an appendicolith is as well. So we have this blind-ended pouch, and then we have this white thing with shadowing. Um, one of the keys with appendicitis is looking all the way to the tip. So one, you want to do that to identify that it's actually the appendix and show that it's a blind-ended pouch. The other thing is these appendicoliths often... Um, live and hang out at the very tip of the appendix. The other thing that you may have seen on um, a CT or ultrasound read is tip appendicitis. 
and that's where just the end of the finger, like where the fingernail is on the appendix, is inflamed. Here's an example of some free fluid. So this circle right here is the appendix. Here's the measurement from outside to outside. And this is the free fluid right here. So again, here's the appendix. Here's a couple of vessels. Um, but we're concerned that this stuff is not, this is not a vessel, this is free fluid. And we know that because it comes to little points, right? So um, anything pointy is usually um, free fluid. So we already mentioned um, the limitations that it's definitely hard to find um, at times because normal appendices can be retrocecal. Um, unfortunately, you know, gas, gas is um, what makes bowel ultrasound so frustrating. Um, and good analgesia. So this is the one where, especially when we talk about pediatric patients, we talk about getting them comfortable, doing other things that maybe we don't even think about um, with adults that we should think about, which is like using warm gel. Um, and making sure they're in a comfortable position. So um, especially because you're going to be touching them where it hurts, um, making sure that they are comfortable enough to let you dig around for a minute and also um, compress if you need to. I would say that for ultrasound, um, looking for the appendix, it's great if you see it. So if you see um, the appendix on ultrasound, you're, you're good. If you don't see it, then that's when you need to think about other tests. And just like um, in the previous lecture when we talked about HIDA scans, ultrasounds, um, and CTs, here I think that um, we definitely have an increased tendency toward CT, which I think is reasonable. The other thing to consider is um, sequential ultrasound. So if there have actually been some studies in pediatric patients where they use um, a conjunction of um, lab work, which is the Alvarado score, white blood cell count, some other things, but also serial exam and serial ultrasound. And sometimes that appendix moves around and pops into place and you see it on the second time. If you don't see it four hours later on a second ultrasound and the kid is completely pain-free and you have them jump up and down and they look good, then it's less likely to be appendicitis, although you should, still should talk about strict return precautions. SVO, which you guys I think are a little bit more familiar with. So let's talk about um, what an SBO looks like. So the first thing is, does anybody have any idea um, which one of these is the small and which one is the large bowel or what are the little structures that we're looking at? So this goes back to anatomy. So these little things are called the plicae circularis um, and they're those little kind of denty things and that identifies the small bowel. We have now are going to switch and we're going to switch to the curvilinear probe. And the reason we're going to switch to the curvilinear probe is so we can assess a larger amount of bowel in kind of a shorter amount of time. Um, and because we're not necessarily looking at just superficial structures. So there's this technique they call the lawnmower technique, which I think is a really great idea. It differs a little bit from what we got, we teach you guys, um, which is to do the four different quadrants in, in two views. Essentially, this is a way to sweep through the entire belly and see everything there. And the nice thing is then you're going to find where you think the bowel is big and where you think the bowel is decompressed. So what we're looking for with SBO is we're looking for dilated loops of bowel. And dilated is defined as greater than two and a half centimeters, proximal to a collapsed section of bowel. And then it's going to have this classic washer machine appearance. So it's going to have to and fro peristaltic motion. And we'll see a couple examples of that. But so here we have an example. Here's a loop of bowel. You can see it's got that starry sky appearance because it's got little flecks of air all over in it. And we measure it and we're like, whoo, that's greater than 2.5 centimeters. That's too big. Here's another example. And we watch those stars and we say, hey, they're not actually going anywhere. So when you watch a normal bowel, these little bits of gas, of swallowed air, of all the things should just be moseying their way throughout the bowel, especially when you press on them, they're going to squish away and move. Otherwise, when they're just sitting in the bowel, they're actually just going to peristalsis along. But here, they're not going anywhere. So here we've got this clip and they're just sort of, like if you look at this little dot, he's like maybe going a half a centimeter this way and a half a centimeter back. So he's not really moving anywhere. Here's another example. And this actually, I think, looks like socks in a washing machine. So they're definitely just circling around and not going anywhere. So they can't move forward because there's a blockage 
Another thing um, to look for in SBO is something we call the keyboard sign. So these are those, our friends, the Pliche Circularis again, and they get edematous because the whole bowel is fluid filled. So we have this large fluid filled um, bit of bowel, and then we see these edematous little finger like projections um, projecting in, um, and those are um, significant for edema of the bowel and possible SBO. Now, what we worry about is not just an SBO, but we worry about a bad SBO, right? So that it's caused bowel ischemia. And so some of the things we look for for bowel ischemia um, are finding suggestive of strangulation um, or ischemia, which is edema. So measuring the actual bowel wall, looking um, to see if it's greater than four millimeters. And there are other things that can cause bowel wall edema. But in this clinical context, um, it would be concerning. Another is an akinetic loop of bowel. So that would be watching a section of bowel for five minutes. Now, just watching poop and gas in general on ultrasound drives me nuts and watching it for five minutes would actually like probably <laughs> um, cause a mental breakdown. So I'm not suggesting that everybody needs to look for akinetic loops of bowel, but it's something to have in the back of your mind. But if it's definitely not moving, that's concerning. And then a large amount of peritoneal or free fluid. Um, there are also large bowel obstructions, which obviously are, are rarer clinically and also rarer on ultrasound, um, but essentially it's the same thing as for small bowel, except for it's the large bowel, so you look for the five centimeters. Um, a couple limitations for the bowel is it's hard to visualize the entire bowel, especially when um, you're working with consultants like um, a surgeon who wants to know the transition point. So I said the definition is that you find um, a dilated loop that's actually proximal to a compressed loop. So that would be the transition point. That's not always seen. Sometimes you just see the dilated area in the washer machine. And so you know that there must be a blockage somewhere upstream, but you don't know exactly where it is. And part of the difficulty there is just that you're having to fan through a large amount of space with just your probe. So you're not using the cross-sectional imaging like a CAT scan and that there could be gas or other things that get in the way. So in conclusion, we quickly covered the appendix, which is a tubular structure down in the right lower quadrant. If you see something that's greater than six millimeters and non-compressible or has associated symptoms of an appendicle or signs of appendicle lift, hyperemia, um, that ring of fire, free fluid, that's concerning for appendicitis. And then for bowel obstruction, we're looking for dilated loops of bowel. Um, followed by a decompressed area. For the small bowel, we're saying greater than 2.5 centimeters. For large bowel, greater than 5. And if we see any free fluid wall edema or complete akinesis, we'll be concerned that there's actually um, ischemic complications from strangulation. All right.